Good afternoon. My name is Raymond Karam, and I'm the Chief Program and Development Officer here at the Arab Gulf States Institute. Um, on behalf of AGSW, I wanted to give a brief welcome to our speakers today, Dr. Mark Thompson, who reminded me last night that he's one of the first friends that we made at the Institute, uh, who joined us from London, uh, and uh, Sultan Thari, a newer friend who made the trip from Boston yesterday. Uh, they, are, I, they are joined by our colleague, Kristen smith Diwan, moderating the discussion today. Uh, you will notice that the format for this discussion has changed with no audience members present except uh, a couple of colleagues uh, uh, on staff. Um, while we miss the buzz of having a room full of colleagues and friends, we're taking seriously the concerns regarding the transmission of the COVID-19 coronavirus. For that reason, access to our programs will be available only via live stream on our website until further notice. I'm sure our speakers and audience members understand and appreciate that move. Uh, I hope that many of you following us today will participate in the discussion, and we encourage you to uh, either tag us on Twitter on our handle at Gulf States Inst, uh, or email us your questions at info at agsiw.org, and we'll make sure to pass the questions to Kristen. In the meantime, please look out for further announcement as we continue to bring you the insightful analysis and content that you've become accustomed to via call-in briefings, webinars, videos, and the usual blogs and papers. As always, you can access all this content on our website at agsiw.org uh, and in our weekly newsletter, The Dow. If you don't receive it on a weekly basis, please make sure to sign up on our website and you'll get it in your inbox every Monday. With that, I'll turn, turn it over to Kristen. Thanks. Thanks, Raymond. Hi, welcome to all of you joining us virtually. Um, we're really glad to be able to keep doing these programs and we're especially thrilled to have with us today uh, Dr. Mark Thompson and Sultan Othari for this conversation about identity and politics in Saudi Arabia. Um, and this is really a book that's prompted, of course, uh, by Dr. Thompson's book, Being Young, Male, and Saudi, which was just published now in 2019. And, um, you know, we're, we're thrilled to have him and to have you come from London, Mark. I know um, this is a challenging time to come, but I think it's a really uh, important conversation to have. And I'm just really thrilled to put to highlight this book that uh, Mark has put out. Um, I've known Mark for quite a long time. And one thing that really strikes you uh, when you meet Mark is how engaging he is and how he really uh, can listen. And um, I think for a short piece that he wrote, he did kind of a teaser piece for us about the book. Um, and kind of one of the taglines of it was that we should be much more now trying to talk to Saudi youth and then talking about Saudi youth. So when I think about that, I, I always think to Mark, um, because though a lot of us you know, go back and forth to the kingdom, Mark, someone who's lived there for a really long time and has had this opportunity uh, to really engage with over a long-term period and to uh, get to know uh, the people of Saudi Arabia and especially young people. Um, he's the long time then for many, many years, seven years, is that right? Was Correct. a senior associate fellow, uh, sorry, assistant professor at the Middle East Studies at King Fahad University, uh, Petroleum and Minerals, and which is, as you know, in the Eastern Province in Dahran. Um, where he was able to teach undergraduate courses, um, particularly on international relations and globalization, which is just such an opportunity, I think, to engage with Saudis on these mm -hmm. key issues that really interest them. Uh, but of course, Mark had been living in the country for some time before that, mm -hmm. I think since 2001. Correct. Is that right? Yeah, and had a lot of experience uh, living both in Riyadh and in Jeddah. And as he'll get to talk to you, he's been able to travel also throughout the kingdom and to engage Saudis from across the kingdom. Um, of course, in addition to this book, uh, I've known Mark for a long time for his earlier writings. He also has a book on um, policymaking, which he wrote with uh, Neil Quilliam, Policymaking in the GCC. Uh, and he's, even before that, I, I knew about your work and engaged with your earlier book on national dialogue and civil society. So he's definitely someone who's been doing a deep dive, really thinking about uh, kind of citizen engagement, people, how they can relate to the state. Um, and now especially really is the person to turn to in thinking about these tremendous generational challenges and changes that are going on. And we're also really happy to have Sultan with us who agreed to come uh, from Harvard where he's studying, uh, come down from Boston. 
take the train? Was it empty? <laughs> it was not a train. It was a oh, plane. It was a plane. <laughs> but it was, was an empty plane. Empty? Okay. My was plane empty. was empty. Your plane was empty. <laughs> it's a very apocalyptic plane. <laughs> <I know. laughs> but here we are. Um, so I, I was really thrilled to be able to have the opportunity to meet Sultan as well uh, when I was giving a talk up at Harvard. And he impressed me immediately with his, his warmth and his engagement. Um, and so he's joining us. I mean, obviously, it's nice to have a Saudi male when yes. we're discussing <laughs> Saudi men. But more than that as well, I mean, Sultan is a scholar in his own right, yeah. uh, where he did his undergraduate at Boston, it's Boston University, Boston right? Boston College. Boston College. Big difference. Sorry. We're Big rivals. Oh my God. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's fine. Um, and so anyway, when he studied at Boston College, um, he worked on his thesis, which really looks at the correlation uh, trying to think and really define uh, youth empowerment. Mm -hmm. uh, how should we think about that? What does it look like? Mm -hmm. And then how do you kind of execute that in mm -hmm. policy? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's sort of a fair agree. thing. And I think it's also, we're, we're going to be diving, I know both of these scholars are going to be thinking more about these issues. And I know, Mark, you're planning on hopefully doing another workshop on kind of some of these issues. On Saudi right. youth policy, yes. This, mm -hmm. Hopefully this summer, depending okay. on how things go. Yes. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Never know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, let's dive right in. Uh, I wanted to just say something, though, about this topic of, of Saudi youth, because it's something that um, is really dear to my heart as well. Um, I was able to travel to the kingdom for the first time in 2011, mm -hmm. so after Mark, but at a time. And I, I think I was really struck immediately. I mean, I, I had some trepidation. I have to say, I'm somebody I've been working on the Gulf for many years before that, over a decade before, and all of the other smaller countries, but hadn't had the opportunity to go to Saudi Arabia. And in some ways, it was kind of intimidating. And I think we'll be able to talk about that, uh, some of the impressions that people have from outside the kingdom, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. hard to get to know and hard to go into. Mm -hmm. And I think what really struck me when I went to Saudi Arabia was uh, right away, I mean, not only the warmth of the desire for engagement, and of course, the Saudi is a completely globalized place. I mean, this is a place mm -hmm. where amongst the cities, people have been engaged for some time, which is something that you look at, of course. Um, but especially engaging then with the younger population, I mean, it was impossible not to be impressed with uh, just the, the amazing creativity yes. that was coming out of this generation. Yes. Um, and of course, people mm -hmm. then that could engage with that uh, through uh, online and through social media, and particularly kind of expressed, I think, uh, through these kind of YouTube channels that were coming mm. up, both U-Turn and Telfaz 11, and the mm. kind of creative videos sure. that they were putting mm. out, the humor. Mm. Um, and also from my own perspective, uh, engaging with them, the incredible active discussions mm -hmm. that people were having, uh, mm. really about public affairs, mm. wanting to say more about mm. what Saudi's role should be, mm -hmm. you know, how Sa what Saudi's role should be within the country, mm -hmm. and then Saudi's role and their mm -hmm. place within the country, within the region and the mm -hmm. rest of the world. And I think the third thing that really impressed me was this um, palpable desire and yearning to contribute yes. um, and mm. to really have a say mm. uh, and kind of making, building this kind of mm. young, still sure. relatively young, mm. uh, new country. Mm. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, I, I only had the opportunity, and of course I've stayed engaged, but I've gone back and forth. But mm. for you, Mark, uh, you had uh, this opportunity from your position there at the, you know, at the university teaching to really uh, engage with young Saudis over a long period of time. So I guess uh, really the opportunity then to dig deeper into yeah. it through this book, why, tell us a little bit about why this particular angle and particular, you know, because mm. I think it's kind of striking, of course, to have a, a book that's young, male, and Saudi. So why did you want to write a book about Saudi young men okay. in particular? Well, first of all, thank you very much for to the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington for inviting me again. And um, as Raymond said, it's lovely to be back here after, I think it's five years since I was here last time. Uh, thank you, Kristin, for the very generous um, introduction. And it's also lovely to have Sultan here, who I've also known um, sort of for several years. And I also work uh, quite closely with Sultan's uh, uh, sister, Sara, at the Miska Institute. So it's great to be here. Um, just to sort of touch on something that you mentioned in your introduction about sort of the engagement. I mean, I'm often asked, um, what's the biggest sort of change that I've seen in Saudi Arabia amongst young people since I first arrived there in January 2001? 
And I would say that it's this sort of desire to engage with the world. I mean, that has increased so much. Yes. And through that desire to engage, this sort of desire, as Christian, as you said, to, to discuss these issues very seriously, um, to have uh, conversations about these, the issues that are affecting their lives. Um, and indeed, when I was um, doing the book, which I'll talk about a little bit later, I mean, what struck me was wherever I went in the kingdom and whoever I talked to from you know, people from all walks of life, not just university students, was, you know, their grasp of a lot of the issues was remarkable. Yes, you know, even sort of, for example, talking to sort of National Guard soldiers in Kasim. Huh? Um, I, I decided to write or to research and write this book, um, not just because I was working at, a, 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 obviously, at a male university at uh, a King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals, um, but because I felt that with, with the sort of um, socioeconomic and sociocultural uh, changes that we've seen happen in Saudi Arabia over the last few years, um, in the West, uh, the focus on how these changes, how these transformations were affecting society was very often looked at from the female perspective, very often the way that the role of Saudi women was changing was that was what the, where the focus was. And really not so much on how these transformations were affecting young, uh, young Saudi men. So um, I felt that this was very important because obviously as the role of Saudi women changes, then that then has an, that has an effect on the role of, of young Saudi men and the way that they see themselves. Um, so, you know, I'll apologize now, you know, um, it, it doesn't mean that I'm disregarding the female perspective at all. Rather, it's, I feel um, that, because I've done a lot yeah, of separate research. I've done, done a lot of research on Saudi women, yes, over the years. It's rather that I feel that sort of the, the, the perceptions of young men were sort of somewhat disregarded. And in fact, when I was um, talking to a, um, one of the, uh, the ladies in the Majlis Ashura um, a couple of years ago and telling her about this project, she immediately answered to me, well, what about the women? <laughs> And I said to her, now, if I'd, say, if I'd said to you that I was doing a project on young Saudi women, would you have replied, and what about the men? Mm -hmm. And she went, no, point taken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that this was, this was, this was what I felt was very important. Um, um, I think that although this book looks specifically at sort of young Saudi men, you know, I also think that a lot of the issues that are discussed here are applicable to Saudi youth as a whole, yes? And indeed, also to their global peers. Um, and I think I want uh, another important thing I wanted to sort of, another important point I wanted to stress <coughs> was that actually, you know, a lot of non-Saudis, a lot of people in the West who know very little about the kingdom, you know, think about it as this sort of, sort of mysterious place over there and what have you. But actually, a lot of these young men's concerns, you know, are remarkably similar to the, their Western peers, you know, finding a job, you know, affordable housing, the cost of living, getting married, things like this. And so it was a way really also of showing that, the, that, that, that these issues that affect young Saudi men also affect other people elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I could just, um, if I could just expand on that, I think <clears throat> I'd like to also thank uh, Mark for, for highlighting the perspective of Saudi men because it's often neglected within this the, the pace of reform that's mm. currently mm. being undertaken at the kingdom. Mm. Um, this ties into a broader issue of media representation, mm. and I thank you for highlighting the richness of Saudi men and Saudi youth mm. at a time mm. where the Middle East is viewed at, mm. a, as, at, at a juncture point. Mm. Um, I think Saudi youth, there is a tendency to view Saudi youth, and specifically men, as a monolith. There is no intellectual diversity, mm. there's no spectrum, and no richness, and mm. I think that not at, is at best, I think, Orientalist, mm. and at worst, I think it's outright discriminatory against youth that are not only mm. ambitious but they but but um, represent a diversity of opinion mm. that uh, intends to drive <coughs> the reform project in Saudi Arabia. Mm. For the yeah. sorry, I just wanted to mm -hmm. pick up on that point um, and talk about the when you're trying if you're trying then to get a view of like an entire generation in particular of. Saudi men, that's obviously a really difficult project mm -hmm. to do. So how do you go about doing that? I mean, how did you undertake that basically through your research? Because obviously there has to be a certain technique in trying to capture that because it's too difficult, right, to just try to say, like I'm speaking 
for Saudi men. Yeah. So how did you kind of work to incorporate the views, and especially in, in Saudi Arabia, where you know, it's not always necessarily very easy to go in no. and do some of this research, which gives, mm. it makes it more difficult to do this kind of grasp this you know, representation? Well, fortunately, over the years, you know, I've sort of built up trust um, with mm -hmm. sort of people across the kingdom. But what I decided... I, the main sort of component of my field work for this book was actually focus groups. Mm -hmm. And I did around 50 to 60 focus groups all across Saudi Arabia, uh, in all areas of the kingdom, with, with young Saudis from all walks of life. Um, and the reason that I did that was because, um, I mean, I'm sure those of you who know Saudi Arabia know it's a very social society. Uh, it's a society where people like to sit down and talk. Mm -hmm. And so by making it, making this sort of the read, the field work, the focus group social, this allowed me to actually listen to a whole variety of opinions um, about the, these very, very important issues. Um, I was often asked when I set up the focus groups, you know, one of the questions was often, you know, how long is it going to take? And I would reply, well, you know, about an hour. And it was never an hour. You know, it was three hours, seven hours, three days, you know. I mean, it went on because actually once, and we always met, I, I always went to them. I mean, I, and I always had these focus groups on their terms. So I always asked, okay, where do you want to go? Where do you want to meet? So is it in the Istiraha, on the beach, in the park, you know, at the coffee shop, somebody's house, wherever? So it was always on their own terms. So in a way... What we were doing was we were having conversations that they were having anyway. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so we were having these conversations. And I, uh, you know, I used to tell them at the beginning of the focus groups, well, you know, this is sort of the ideas I've got for the chapters of the book. This is what I'm thinking about talking. And then I would really let them direct the conversations about what they thought was important. Because I felt that, you know, there's too much is written about, about, you know, sort of young Saudis where it's sort of predetermined about this is how they think, this is what they think. And I think, as you pointed out in one of your tweets about, you know, talking about youth, not to youth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that so the focus groups, that was really the main um, the main thing that I did. Um, I ended up with 90,000 words of notes from the focus groups. Um, I never record my focus groups um, deliberately because once you put a microphone there it changes the dynamic uh, so I just took notes um, but I, I, I a lot of the time that the, you know, these yet these young people were actually telling me no you know this is the, this is that but they really enjoyed it you know they really enjoyed the opportunity to agree with each other disagree with each other to actually talk about these issues very seriously because these are issues that impact their lives yes and some of these sessions even sort of, you know, they seem to sort of <laughs> turn almost into therapy <laughs> sessions at times, you know. Uh, so, but it was fascinating and I learned so much from this. I mean, it was, ex I mean, it was an extraordinary experience which I'd love to do again. And it was also great fun um, to actually be sort of involved mm -hmm. with them and in their discussions. And it was very illuminating. I did sort of back this up with surveys, of course, that mm -hmm. I did and interviews. Um, but really the other sort of the, the sort of the quantitative side of, of this research was really to support the sort of mm -hmm. the qualitative side that came from, from the focus groups because that to me was the most important and that to me was what gave me the sort of the very rich data. Mm -hmm. mm. And did you, um, when you were doing this research, I mean, of course, we're trying to capture some of the diversity mm -hmm. Uh, and viewpoints, were you traveling to different regions of Saudi Arabia to do this, uh, to incorporate different viewpoints? Because I know that's one of the things when people are trying to understand Saudi Arabia today. Um, a lot of people say, well, this is how things are in Riyadh. Mm. But do we see, would it be like that if we went to other regions in Saudi Arabia? Is that something that you thought about? In oh, absolutely. I mean, well? absolutely. So take, for example, Riyadh. I had multiple focus groups in Riyadh, mm -hmm. you know, with different constituencies in Riyadh, not just those 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 sort of educated Saudis who go to the think tanks or go to the sort of the academic conferences. You know, I, I talked to National Guard soldiers. I talked to entrepreneurs. Um, and I, you know, so I, it wasn't just about sort of going to different parts of the kingdom. It was also about talking to different constituencies within those areas. So, of course, I went to Katif, you know, mm -hmm. but I didn't just go to Katif. I did, I think, four or five different focus groups in different areas of Katif. And, and the same in Kasim and the same mm -hmm. in Asir. 
And I also, you know, sort of actually had specific focus groups of young men who were sort of working in specific sectors. So for example, I talked to medical students and in medical interns in, in, in Abha and in um, Al Hassa as well. Um, so it, it was very important for me to, to, you know, to try and get a very broad spectrum of, of, of different types of people. Because I think, again, you know, Riyadh is, you know, there are so many different parts of Riyadh. There are so many different constituencies mm -hmm. in Riyadh. And the same in Jeddah, the same in, in the eastern province. Um, sometimes it was quite difficult to sort of arrange some of these things. So, for example, I, you know, as a non-Muslim, I couldn't go to Mecca. But I was able to get, um, for example, Sharia law students, you know, from Mecca to come to Jeddah. You know, and I and they were a part, they formed part of a focus group there. So the you know just the opportunity to travel around the kingdom and to sort of sit down and talk to these people was uh, extraordinary. Mm -hmm. mm. And um, one thing I, I sure became part of the conversation, um, especially as you're traveling around and, and trying to get a feel of this younger generation, how they see things, is the whole question of identity. Mm. Um, and I'll want to bring you in on this too, mm. Sultan, in a minute. Mm. Um, I think you even titled one of your early chapters, like, what is Saudi, mm. right? So mm. when you're trying to capture the, what is a complexity, like you said, is often presented as a mm. monolith, but when you think about Saudi Arabia, mm. um, we can talk about, you know, religion, which is usually mm. a lot of the way that the kingdom is portrayed. Uh, some people talk about it being a tribal mm. society, but you also have this great diversity mm. in regions mm. um, and opinions towards religion. Mm. Um, as well as different life situations like mm. you were talking about. Mm. So when you were having these conversations, um, how did this issue of identity, which is the core topic, by the way, of your book, and let me say for one minute real quick, uh, Mark's <laughs> book, because I promised him I would do this, and we, we did this as an opportunity, and we were hoping to have people here and to be able to present the book and to have you, we have copies for you to purchase, but since you're not here, um, we do have on the website, actually, uh, the code, right? I'm asking Raymond, the discount code for the book on our website. So I urge you to go and get a copy of the book. But um, as you see, the main uh, subtitle of your book is Identity mm. and Politics First mm. in a Globalized Kingdom. Mm. So when you're looking at this new globalized kingdom, mm. um, what are the, how are the topics of identity, how do those conversations go around national identity, which is a huge issue right now, mm. which I know you'll probably want to talk about, mm. but also these kind of sub-identities and how they negotiate those? Yes, I mean, I, I mean, I, the, 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 the chapter is, 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 you know, part of the chapter is headed, as you said, what is Saudi? And I actually, that, that was a question that I actually asked the focus groups, you know, what do you think is Saudi? Um, and I think the the majority of the young men that I talked to, you know, they, they, they completely agreed that a Saudi national identity exists, but sometimes the sort of the coherence of that identity was something that they were themselves sort of confused about, or they were not uh, very, you know, not entirely sure what that meant. Um, I think that... Um, it varied, of course, depending on who I was talking to and where I was talking to them. And it varied as well about uh, depending on what sort of identities we were discussing and what, and what this particular group or this particular individual felt was his primary identity. You know, was, you know, was national identity a primary identity or was it um, religious identity? Was it family identity, tribal identity, whatever? And I think that obviously varied, yes? And then, of course, you know, there were the questions related to not just that type of identity, but also to their, an online identity as well. Because obviously, since 2009, we've seen this massive increase in social media across Saudi Arabia. And, um, and you, you have these young Saudis who are you know, online 24-7. Um, and actually, you know, they have specific sort of online identities depending on sort of what platforms they're using so they can have more than one online identity so i think this you know this is a very complex situation um and then you mentioned globalization as well and of course yes i mean it's also you know what is the impact of you know how do you see the impact of globalization or in your opinion is it globalization is it is it westernization in your opinion or even That's americanization you know or mcdonaldization you know how do you see this as you know, do you see this as a positive and negative thing how is it affecting your perception of being a saudi and it was very interesting how i would 
I taught a course on globalization at King Fahad University, and this was something that we used to discuss, obviously. Um, and it was very interesting, for example, that I, the students would write essays in their exams, and they would actually write, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned that globalization is eroding my, my, my national identity, that it's eroding Saudi culture. And they wrote this while sitting there wearing jeans, and T-shirt and baseball bat capwards, you know, back, back backwards. So I think that sort of showed the sort of the contradictions that also exist, yeah. And whether you know how they were sort of dealing with this. Um, I think sometimes it, it, it certainly when we think about globalization, I think that sometimes that that they found it difficult to talk about this because they sort of lacked an understanding of sort of the sort of the processes associated with globalization and the issues it was just you know to them it was just mcdonald's mm. and things like this not all of them though, no not all of them but a lot of them <laughs> a lot of them yes um and i think this is one of the conundrums that they face um so it's a, it's you know the whole question of identity is is highly complex and and as as sultan mm -hmm. mentioned um you know, you can't sort of generalize, you can't sort of treat all of these young people sort of as one huge homogenous <coughs> group, yes? Mm -hmm. And I think a very important point that, that needs to be made and, and one that, you know, I'm, I make quite frequently is that obviously at the moment, um, Saudi Arabia is undergoing this enormous transition, which is affecting sort of every aspect of life. And Transitions are, by their very nature, um, messy and um, sometimes difficult to understand. And I think that a lot of the questions that we're asking now about identity, about about the questions I you know talk about in my book, I think sometimes we don't have very sort of. It, it would be nice to have sort of neat little answers that we can put into neat little boxes, mm -hmm. but that isn't how it is. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a lot of these questions what they do is they raise more questions or they raise discussion. And this is what, when we were talking about what is Saudi, this is very often what happened. It raised these questions and, and it got people to think about, okay, I haven't actually, you know, that's not something I've actually thought about very much before. Mm -hmm. yeah? Maybe in 10 years time, um, when, when, when things are sort of maybe the speed of changes may be sort of um, uh, decrease, I think it might be sort of easier to sort of draw more sort of definite conclusions about some of these things. But I think it's quite difficult at the moment because, mm -hmm. you know, we, you can go to bed tonight and wake up tomorrow morning and everything's changed. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, the, and, and, you know, and perceptions change as well. And, uh, and yeah. Yeah, very much so. Mm. That, um, that speed of change is something that I know all Saudi, well, all Saudis are dealing with. Um, of course, it's being driven a lot by mm. by the changes that are going on that that, that young people want to see and yes. see changes happening. Mm. But I think even amongst the young people at the the forefront of that, sometimes it can be disorienting. We we had a young Saudi artist here, I, I adore. Uh, I had Ella Moody, maybe mm. some of you know, and a lot of her work engages with this kind of idea of like, how do we even manage this change and kind of draws on tropes. Uh, so it's really interesting just to watch Saudis kind of in real time digest digest that. Um, but I wanted to ask if I could just really quickly ask Sultan, is it, a, I'm kind of curious by something you said about this being a contradiction between kind of a globalization, this mm. global identity, and then your national identity and this kind of thing. Do Saudis see it as a contradiction, or at least for some Saudis, is that something that they live with every day? I'm just curious how they kind of process that. Mm. I think there's a couple of things to say here. First is that as direct consequence uh -huh. of globalization, identities are much more fluid in Saudi Arabia. Yes. So the fluidity is there, mm. and that brings about a great deal of confusion. However, I do think that Saudis have been very skilled and adept in dealing with the force of globalization mm -hmm. and creating a harmonious relationship between the, the globalized identity mm -hmm. and the local identity. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's an entirely false notion to state that Saudis regard their society, culture, uh, and history as anachronistic. I think they would like to mm -hmm. um, include, in a, I mean, mm -hmm. in a harmonious way, mm -hmm. um, bring in the globalized force mm. and the local force. And mm. I think they've, they've done a skillful job in doing that. Mm. And I mentioned that to Mark earlier. Mm. I think a collective, cohesive national identity is central to, mm. sa to, to Saudi youth, specifically mm. Saudi men. Mm. And I think they, they don't allow the force of globalization mm. to erode that entirely. Mm. Mm. I think what they do is frame globalization or mm. include it in an inclusive way mm. within their national identity. I think mm. that's a delicate balance that that is striked mm. by policymakers mm. and youth alike. Mm. 
Because I know when I was teaching the course on globalization, which was a very popular course, and you know, a lot of young, a lot of the, my students would say, you know, they felt that it was a fantastic opportunity for them to actually have to study this, to think about it, yeah. and to to think about their place in society. And I always used to say to them, you know, you absolutely must do this because at the end of the day, in the not too distant future, yeah. your children are going to grow up here, and you need to think about the type of kingdom that you want your children to grow up in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I, 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 mm. I think there is a very big opportunity at the mm. intersection of globalization mm. and the, the national cohesive identity. Mm. Uh, a lot of policy interventions could be made on behalf of the Ministry of Culture, mm. I think the Ministry of Education, mm. to leverage multiculturalism without exacerbating societal tensions mm. or fault lines mm. between identities. Mm. And that way you can create mm. a much more robust national cohesive identity that is in line mm. with the globalized identity of youth mm. on a more broader scale. Mm. What you want is malleable, agile mm. youth who are able to relay their Saudi identity with pride, mm. but at the same time integrate within a broader global framework. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And that's the point I was making about sort of the desire to engage. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, when we think about globalization um, and when we think about uh, how to deal with that on the national level, it, it doesn't strike Saudis just on an identity level, though, but also in terms of the economy. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, there's been a, a huge shift in uh, the perspective of, of what Saudis need to be doing, and particularly what young Saudis need mm. to be doing to contribute mm. to their country that comes from the shift in, in, in the global economic mm. posture of Saudi and the fact that, mm. you know, they know that they are going to have to move to some degree the economy beyond oil. And you said in your kind of lead in, uh, Mark, that for for Saudis, really employment was yeah. the big issue. And a lot of the tension is not just about your identity and your this kind of place and negotiating these different um, regions of the country and posture and with mm. your family, but also just how you're going to engage and make your own way practically <laughs> yes. in the world. So tell us a little bit about from your from your discussions, what the young Saudis were saying, uh, that men that you were talking to, uh, were they, how anxious were they about their future, and and did they see a very direct and certain path, kind of to public employment, which has been the norm in Saudi, mm -hmm. or or did they see themselves see things differently? Well, I think we 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 well, I saw we all saw a huge change, sort of post two thousand and fourteen, um, when the oil price dropped. I mean, for example, at King Fahad University, where I was working, um, pre 2014, the graduates all received sort of five to six job offers, you know, all of them. Post 2014, for that period when it, life was very difficult for some sectors, you know, they were not getting any job offers at all. And that was a huge shock. Um, I think there was a sort of, a, you know, every cloud has a silver lining, if you like. And I think what that did was that it, that it sort of, triggered a change in sort of mentality to, to, to an attitude to work and employment. Um, last summer, I met uh, a group of former students in Riyadh who I taught in 2013. And I asked them, I said, I said, when I taught you back in 2013, I said, you know, how many of you in the three classes that I taught, around 120 students, how many of you in 2013 either had a part-time job or volunteered. And they said, well, actually, almost nobody, yes? And I said, what about now, today in 2019? What percentage have a part-time job or volunteer? And you're talking about 80%. Yes. You know, and that's a huge change and a change in mentality. And were the they doing it out of necessity? Or were they, they were doing, doing it out of, out of well, part, part, some of them, for some of them, it was a necessity. For some of them, they saw it as a way of gaining some sort of independence from their families, not having to take money from their father or something. For others, it was because they saw the benefit of actually being able to put this on their CV. Um, even if volunteering was something that they could put on their CV. For others, it was a way of expanding their sort of social networks, if you like, meeting different types of people. And for others, of course, it was very important to meet members of the opposite sex, you know. <laughs> so, you know. It's volunteering. Yeah, it's volunteering. That. But that's a huge change. So I think that, you know, we've, we've seen this big change in mentality. We've seen um, people now sort of, we've seen, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, there was always this talk about, oh, Saudis won't do this type of job. Saudis won't do that type of job. 
I mean, and that has changed so much, mm -hmm. you know, so much, okay. you know. I mean, I take my car to Hyundai Motors. All the technicians who fix my car are, are Saudis. And in fact, the person at Hyundai Motors that books me in is a Saudi woman. You know, and that's at, that's at a, a, a car place. And, and this is, you know, in the hospitals, in shops, waiters, I mean, uh, taxi drivers, I mean, right across the board. So this sort of change in mentality, I think, is very, very important because I think it also has shown a lot of, of, of younger people that there are other options, you know, rather than mm -hmm. just the public sector option, there are actually other options. Yeah. And of course, that links to, you know, the, the sort of the entrepreneurship trend that we've seen, the mm -hmm. sort of, you know, the sort of wanting to have a startup, wanting to maybe be more in control of your own destiny as well, and not just you know, sort of part of a big machine and not just sort of as, as has been said to me, not just as a number in, in a big company, but actually sort of actually having your own identity somewhere. And I think that's very, you know, extremely important. Um, and of course, I mean, finding a job is, 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 again, as I said at the beginning, this is, a, this is not just something that young Saudis think about, mm -hmm. as young people everywhere think about finding jobs because yeah. they want job security, <coughs> excuse me, they want... <coughs> You know, they want to be able to afford to get married and things like this. So it's it's probably not surprising that when you're talking to the age group that I was talking to was around 18 to 25. So it's probably not surprising when you're talking to sort of, you know, this sort of early 20 something uh, generation that a lot of them are going to be very concerned about what they're going to be doing in the future or the type of job that they already have or whether they're unemployed or whether they're going to be able to change jobs. Um, I mean, it's it's it's. I think that's quite natural. But I do think that you know the important thing is this very important thing is is, is this sort of this sort of change in mentality yeah. to work, mm. to attitudes to work, and and I think that's it's you know, extremely positive, yes. you know, and something that I I think is 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 has really made this amongst this twenty something generation is really making a difference. Mm. Of course, one of the concerns for a lot a lot of young men nowadays. We're looking for a job. Is that, of course, in recent years, and this is something that has come a bit of a shock to them, is that actually now they're competing for jobs with women, mm -hmm. which is not something that happened before. And there are certain sectors where you know there is quite clearly a preference to employ Saudi women over Saudi men now. So, and you know, it's come as quite a shock to a lot of them. I think for some of them, it was probably quite good. It sort of made them pull the socks up a bit. <laughs> uh, but that's not, you know. They, and so again, I think this is. Uh, Again, it's a, it's a it's a complex situation, but it's not surprising that this is this is something that uh, that they discussed. They they consider they consider to be one of the most important, if not the most important issue. Yeah, mm. and is that part? Um, I mean, I know that there's been a lot of a lot of efforts um, mm. in trying to expand the the economy. I mean, we talk about diversification, but it, it's really striking in Saudi Arabia that a lot of the diversification that we that we see that's really notable has taken place in these uh, areas that I, I guess you, you might imagine could be of some interest or more engaging for youth. We've seen a lot of push into areas of, of kind of more creative yeah. arts. Um, a lot of the art councils, uh, the new right. Ministry of Culture that you were talking about mm, has sure. been moving a lot in that direction sure. uh, in terms of tourism, mm. of course, and entertainment. Um, is that something that you think is... Is it, is it attractive to, I mean, obviously to some Saudis it is, but what, what kind of role is that expansion of the economy, if I can just ask Sultan? Well, what I, what, what I think personally is, ties into our previous point, that it's, it's a more individualized, mm. entrepreneurial mm. sentiment that's mm. arising within the Saudi individual. Yeah. And I think that is part of the globalized, that's part of globalization. Mm. Increased global interconnectivity, social mm. media has revealed these aspects of identity. You know, Saudis can mm. now happily work 16, 18 hour work yeah. days and they're willing to contribute to national development in ways that have never mm. been part of the Saudi identity in the past. Mm. And I think that's one way where, where mm. they have leveraged the forces of global, mm. globalization to promote national development. Mm. I think um, the, the, the push to diversify the Saudi economy is driven pri primarily by Saudi's, Saudi youth's ability mm. to again leverage that force mm. to their benefit. And I think it also reflects mm. A self-expression, yes, in a way, especially mm -hmm. in content. For example, mm -hmm. like you mentioned on on, on Tilfaz and mm -hmm. and 
uh, and otherwise, mm. it, it reflects a way of self-expression yes. that um, reflects the mm. paradoxical aspects mm. of reform. You mm. know, the Saudi individual is at once mm. individualistic mm. and collectivist yeah. within a society. Mm. The Saudi individual is entrepreneurial, mm. but also um, believes in the importance of having, you know, a nuclear family and believes, yeah. you know, in, in, in work-life balance. Mm. So it's not either or. No. And I think that is mm. precisely what makes Saudi youth unique. Mm. But I guess I, I just I wonder about it though sometimes because I think um, amongst the people that I mm. you know have the opportunity to engage with, mm. um, of course there's you know there are a lot of people that have a lot of different interests, right? So uh, people that were involved obviously in politics and kind of political activism have had kind of less area for mm. expression. I think uh, in today's Saudi Arabia, um, kind of having to try to bring them within this kind of very direct national. Uh, frame and a very defined national frame under the particular the leadership right now under um, that's in Saudi Arabia um, but I think also uh, you know a lot of the people I definitely see amongst the people that I engage with this this yearning for uh, expression a desire to do entrepreneurship we do a lot of the things that we do mm -hmm. and online uh, we look a lot at um, uh, kind of issues you know a lot of people that are experimenting in new areas mm, like mm. cuisine and mm, young yeah. Saudis. Mm. But at the same time, um, I know that when the Saudi government was l looking at some of these issues and looking at a uh, desire of young Saudis to move into these things, though I'm seeing this interest and mm. this desire for expression, overwhelmingly Saudis still wanted to work for the government. Mm. So I'm wondering if, you, did you see that in your, um, in, in the, you know, the actual, you know, study focus groups that you were doing, um, is that is that not the case? Because I know when they were actually looking at this, even though there's a desire to kind of shift yeah. things, it's still right. the case right. that that government job has status and has real benefits. No, yeah. well, not just status, but I think you know job security. Right. And I think right. that's that when I you know that's the Absolutely. that's that's the answer that I got sort sure. of pretty much from everybody. I you know post this book, I've been working on that particular issue, exactly. and I've been working on you know, the, the, the problems of sort of getting more young Saudis into private sector employment and sort of weaning them away, if you like, from sort of wanting jobs in the public sector. And I actually did a, I wrote a paper which was uh, part of a series of papers um, uh, that we, uh, which from a workshop that we had at Princeton University last year. Um, and um, I actually did two, I did surveys with students at King Fahad University, which of course is a very academic university, and the same questions to Kasim mm -hmm. University to find out how they answered those questions. And the question that I asked was if you were offered a job in the private or public sector with the same benefits, the same salaries and everything, which would you take? And at King Fahad University, it was 50% saying they wanted a public sector job. And at Kasim University, it was 80%, yes? Interesting. Now, I mean, I, and, and then I asked them why. You know, why do you want a public sector job or why do you want to go into the, the private sector? You know, what are the reasons? In the private sector, it's exactly as you've just been talking about, as Sultan has mm -hmm. mentioned, you just say, Christian, this desire to sort of to grow as an individual, mm -hmm. to have an individual identity, to not be a number. Um, and of course, but yes. when it came to public sector, it was overwhelmingly always job security, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. because that obviously impacts on not just your job security today, but on your future, on, on sort of getting married and yeah. all of these types of yeah. things. Mm -hmm. And I, so I think that it's, um, you know, I think increasingly there are, you know, there are young Saudis, uh, both men and women, who are, be, are able to find a balance between this now. Sure. And we're seeing this, this is changing. But it's not something that you're just going to be able to sort of just sort of go like that and change Absolutely. overnight, you know, mm -hmm. because these are, you know, these are these are sort of quite ingrained sort of uh, <laughs> habits, if you like. So, um, but I mean, it, it, it's, it, you know, if you, I think, the, you know, for the government, you know, and for individual private you know, companies, I mean, obviously what they've got to do is to increase trust in the private sector, to increase trust in the fact that they can offer job security. Uh, and things like that. And so that would then, because I think what we see happening is we do see a lot of young Saudis graduating, maybe going to work for startups, uh, going into private sector, but who will then, at a certain stage, sort of move away from the private sector to go into a public sector job for sort of more sort of job security for their futures. So I think it's a, it's, it's a tricky one, I think, yeah. at the mm -hmm. moment, yeah. Mm. 
And let's jump in a bit more to the mm. gender issues then. And I mm. think the market's a good place to think about it because obviously that's been one of the priorities mm. of the Saudi government. Mm. I mean, if you look at the Vision 2030, one of the top line things that they wanted to do was mm. to increase women's mm. employment, Absolutely. women's employment in the labor force because it was yeah. incredibly low in Saudi Arabia. And mm. we all know that, you know, the country has been investing a lot of money mm and educating young yep. Saudi women, yeah. um, and now wants to get more mm. full use, and also I think change the character mm. of the state by sure. bringing more women mm. uh, into both the workforce and into public space. Um, but I'm wondering then, uh, when you talk to young Saudis then about issues, I mean, how, how w the young men, um, Maybe talk a little bit about that since we're on the question of employment, but then I'm also just curious about the interaction and, of course, the future and thinking about kind of marriage and, and mm. what that looks like, the kind of relations. Because, of course, if you're a young Saudi, you want to have a job and then mm. you want to have a family. You know, yeah. For most people, you want to have a, a family. I mean, I think the, I mean, the vast majority of young men I, I spoke to um, felt that having more women going into employment was a good thing because it was good for the national economy, sure. mm -hmm. you know. And the point that they would ma you know, make over and over again is what is the point of the government spending vast sums of money on education if you're not actually going to benefit from that, yes? Um, so, they, I mean, apart from, I had a couple of, I suppose they were, so I was very much a minority who felt that, you know, they wouldn't want to see their female relatives working, you know, very much a minority. Um, and it was the same for, I think, you know, for obviously the driving issue as well. Um, but I think, you know, with the driving issue, I think into, you know, once we saw Saudi women going to work publicly, um, and once that huge change happened, um, then all of a sudden, you know, we realized that the driving thing was going to happen quite fairly soon afterwards because it made economic sense. So I think that, that there wasn't, there's no, this is something that's been accepted. Um, I think it, it obviously raises questions about um, gender relations in a, in a right. mixed workforce. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the points that is made over and over again to me is that the education system is now out of step with this. So you have single gender universities, single gender colleges, things like this, and then you sort of leave this all male environment, for example, like King Fahad University, sure. you know, and all of a sudden you're catapulted into a, an environment where you're working with Saudi women, unrelated Saudi women, which can be quite stressful for some of people, you know. And then one of my students said to me about his brother, he said, you know, his brother had a, a desk job and he was, his desk was actually between two Saudi women he'd never met before. And he said, you know, he said, my brother basically had a nervous breakdown for three months, you know. And, and of course, you know, young Saudis coming to me being, abs you know, young Saudi men coming to me being absolutely shocked because they've been for an interview and they've been interviewed by a Saudi woman. Mm -hmm. And they, were, they just weren't expecting this. And I thought what was interesting was that they would often sort of say to me, we know there's no, there isn't a problem here. You know, my head is telling me this is fine. Mm -hmm. But my heart is sort of telling me something else because that's not how I was brought up. That's not what the university is like. Um, when we, for example, when I interviewed um, candidates for jobs at uh, King Fahad University, you know, from overseas, one of the questions I would always sort of point to them, I'd say, do you do understand that this is an all-male university? And they would say, yes, I know we're only going to, you know, we're gonna, I'm only going to be teaching young men and I said no that's not what I said this is an all male <laughs> university you know everybody here is a man you know can you cope with that and actually some westerners coming into work can't cope with that so if you think about that in the reverse then you're going into the workplace where suddenly you're not in a in a single gender environment it can be quite 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 stressful yeah. so I think you know I think I think the education system here is out of step obviously mm -hmm. although I have to say that this year in September, um, female postgraduate students were um, started at King Fahad University. Yes, yes. so that's yeah. a, that's a, is a, that's a change. It's, it's changing. Mm. Yes. Mm. And how about um, questions then about about marriage or mm. those sorts of issues? I'm sure that came up in your conversations as well. Oh or yes. How to meet people? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean that obviously was one of the most popular topics, as you can probably imagine. Um, uh, I mean, the, the, the big concern for a lot of the young men I spoke to, particularly those who weren't from sort of wealthy backgrounds or didn't come from sort of elite backgrounds, of course, was the cost of getting married. 
you know, not just a question of, you know, getting married, but how they were going to be able to afford to get married. Um, I asked them sort of, you know, about uh, their views on sort of, you know, sort of their female relatives, so asking their female relatives to find a suitable wife and things like this. Um, that, for the majority, that was fine, um, but they also said that um, they needed to meet the woman first um, mm -hmm. to get to know her, because obviously one thing that is of concern is the, is the divorce rate, and actually most divorces happen in the first year of marriage. Um, and then when you look at the, 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 the statistics for what weddings cost, um, it's absolutely phenomenal. I mean, sort of the amounts of money that are spent on weddings often, very often by people who can't afford to have that type of lavish wedding and end up sort of taking out bank loans or borrowing money. Um, and then, you know, they, after a year they get divorced and they're sort of saddled with, with this huge debt. So you've got that sort of economic side to it as well. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's of great concern. And that, of course, is linked to then also, you know, how am I, you know, ha you know affordable housing? You know, how am I going to be able to get somewhere to live? You know, am I going to have to rent? Can I afford to rent? You know, how can I afford, you know, how can I afford to buy somewhere? Um, so those, again, those questions, I think what's interesting is, of course, all of these questions are interlinked, you know, with, you know, employment, um, housing, marriage, cost of living, they all, they all affect each other, yes, mm -hmm. um, which I think is very important. Um, but, I, you know, the vast majority of, of, of the young men I talked to, as I said, you know, they didn't sort of, they felt that, you know, sort of get, you know, for example, one of my friends who has a startup and a PhD from a Western university, you know, he's, he's from Kasim. I went to his wedding in Oneza, and that was um, a, 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 a lady that... Um, you know, he'd been found for him by his female relatives. And when I asked him, I said, you know, are you happy with that? Is, is that fine with you? And he replied to me, he said, yes, because that's who we are. Mm -hmm. yeah? So again, this is linked to mm -hmm. the first sort of questions about identity as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but I think it must be interesting in this mm. kind of rapidly changing mm. environment, how to sync up those expectations. Yes. Mm. And one of the big issues that comes up then is this whole issue of defining the generation, and you said that that was one of the main concerns that they had was how to define these different generations and the big gaps, like mm. between the generations. Mm. And I know that plays out mm. in gender and in other areas. Yes. Yeah. And I'm just kind of wondering. I don't know if you want to say something to sure. that, Sultan, sure. about the expectations, uh, particularly in these relations uh, from young people, because I know that's something that you looked at mm. in your research Absolutely. as well. And it's not only my research; I live it. You live it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so you it's research, it's yeah. really important to emphasize that point. Is that yeah. um, I come from a family of very, very strong women, mm. um, who I'm very, very proud of, mm. and. Um, I think Saudi, Saudi females are nothing less than a force to be reckoned with. I mean, they're absolutely the main drivers of reform, um, not only in their will, but in how they're integrating into the workforce more broadly. In my research, going back to my research, um, when I filtered data according to age group, so I had three filters, age group, uh, employment sector, and uh, finally gender. So the younger we got, there is closer consonance between male and female views. Mm -hmm. On a policy level, that means that policies going forward don't necessarily have to consider females mm -hmm. as the other. Mm -hmm. And that reflects a great success mm -hmm. in how the, mind sh the mindset shift is, is occurring in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Second point, I think, is that as we got, as my data, I saw my data, get, the, the, the respondents get younger, mm -hmm. it's more progressive and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So again, the, mind, the mindset shift is, is, is there and it's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Third, I think, is that, and one of the, the, the important reasons why uh, I think we, uh, we, we, should, we should research Saudi males and that it, there are, they, they represent a greater insight into the policy limitations in the labor force, mm -hmm. in the education sector. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in my research, when um, I asked respondents what areas of Saudi society can be improved to create a better future for youth, better youth empowerment, and females were more likely to cite um, an increase in opportunity, while males cited an increase in the quality of education, yes. pointing to a skill set yes. mismatch yes. between public education mm. and the demands of the labor market, mm. specifically the private mm. sector. Yes. We're talking soft skills like yes. um, team leadership. Mm. We're talking uh, mm. problem solving, critical mm. thinking. So there, I think they, I mean, men yeah. represent a more accurate lens yes. to view these issues. Mm. So that's why researching them is, I think, indispensable. Yeah. The fourth point, I think, is that 
um, when I've asked respondents what makes them, what makes Saudi youth unique, males were, were more likely to cite how they've successfully integrated their globalized identity within their Saudi identity, while females emphasized that they believe they have the will and capacity to drive reform. So there was a sense of invigorated excitement amongst females that I think is reflected um, on, in the upper echelons of a government through effective policy implementations that leverage females to become at a, pos at a position to be um, in greater inclusion in the workforce and representation. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's important to have an inclusive model of empowerment, not only for youth, but for females in, spe in specific. And I think the young generation are very much for that, including myself, obviously. Mm. Um, well, maybe um, let's talk about some of these issues then about participation then um, and where, where you kind of see where, how young Saudis kind of view that, um, mm. kind of how they wanted to be included in this national conversation. Um, and that includes women, because um, mm. we've had it like very, it's, it's been a time of kind of change and we've seen a lot of different voices coming mm. uh, from, from Saudi women about the way that they want to see things mm. uh, develop in the country. So what, what did you hear from your, your conversations well, about, uh, and I know that you, you've done some research and want to talk about this too, well, Sultan, mm. but about how to kind of define uh, kind of participation and, yeah. and how they see their role in kind of national development. Well, again, you know, sort of going back to what I just said before, I mean, they, they you know, a lot of these young people would sort of say to me, what's the point of, of this, all of this education? What's the point of the King Abdullah Scholarship Program if we're not actually going to be used afterwards? You know, mm -hmm. so I think there's an awareness there. And I would agree with what Sultan was saying about sort of a lot of young men being very critical of their education, particularly their sort of secondary school education. Uh, which they see as not sort of, uh, you know, sort of actually helping them very much. And of course, that's the reason why so many Saudi universities need these orientation preparatory year programs uh, before they actually enter the students into the university because they actually have to bring them up to a certain level. Um, but I think, again, you know, going back to what I said earlier about sort of wanting to engage, I mean, there's, there's no doubt that when, for example, Vision 2030 was uh, introduced in uh, 2016 when it was launched and I was sitting with a group of young Saudis in Riyadh watching this. Um, I mean, this, this raised sort of expectations that sort of, you know, now we're going to actually be able to, 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 to take part in building the kingdom. We're going to be able to be part of this conversation. We're going to be able to be part of sort of decision-making processes. I think that that is certainly in some is certainly happening. Um, I remember going back to I think 2000 and I think it was 2009. I remember when King Abdullah went to London for the G20 and going to a seminar then, um, which was um, given by the then British ambassador to Riyadh. But all the past British ambassadors to Riyadh were also there, and I remember. Um, and the ambassador sort of saying, you know, one of the problems in Saudi Arabia was, you know, sort of the lack of an Im intermediate stratum, as it were. Um, you either had the top or the bottom and not really very much in between. But we've seen in recent years how the scholarship program and also sort of domestic education, how uh, from the good universities, how suddenly this is now being created. This intermediate stratum is there. And that there are a lot of young Saudis, you know, very able, super smart young Saudis who are in important decision-making processes, whether it's in the ministries, whether it's in the private sector. And that's a huge change from the past, huge change. So I think there's, you know, I think, I think increasingly there's a realization that I can be part of this. I can be part of decision-making in certain sectors, not necessarily. I think a lot of this relates to sort of sort of more to the low politics side of things, I suppose. Um, but there is a realization that I can be part of this. The boom in, you know, sort of the consultancy business in Saudi Arabia has, of course, allowed a lot of young Saudis from, you know, to also sort of be part of projects that are government projects or hybrid projects. Um, so we've definitely, you know, this is definitely a big change that's happened in the last couple of years. And I feel that, you know, those of you who've, you know, who've been to Saudi Arabia recently, you know, you can feel the energy, you can feel the change, you can sense 
in the air, you know, that things are happening, that, that, that there's a great sort of sense that, you know, our time has come, mm -hmm. if you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's very important. And to be perfectly honest with you, I mean, I've said to a lot of people in the kingdom, you know, a lot of, a lot of people in high positions, I said, you know, when I stand in front of my classes at the universities and I look at this sort of 30, 45 young people sat there, that's your vision. That's your vision 2030 sat there. You know, if you don't utilize this, if you don't channel this, if you don't mold and mentor mm -hmm. this talent, and that could, because the talent is there, you know, if you don't do that, then that's going to be, you know, what's the point? Yes. Because quite clearly, Saudi Arabia has enormous potential, mm -hmm. enormous potential. I mean, think about Japan. I mean, Japan would die to have Saudi Arabia's population, Absolutely. you know? And what that young population who are aspirational, entrepreneurial, engaged with the world very much, you know, that's the reason they want to be engaged. And so it would be very foolish of any government not to include them in, part, you know, in, sure. in, in these decision-making sure. processes. But it is happening, for sure. I mean, I can give another example of, you know, I remember in 2014 going to the Jeddah Economic Forum. And um, the session I remember going to at that point was called Growth Through Youth. Mm -hmm. And it was a two and a half day uh, um, event um, at the Hilton uh, Convention Center in Jeddah. And during those two and a half days, there was only one panel that included young Saudis. And that was two young Saudi men who were given approximately five minutes to speak, <laughs> yes? Now, the audience was full of young Saudis yeah. who were dying to sort of become part Ridiculous. of the conversation, who were sitting there sort of itching to sort of put their <laughs> hand up and talk, and who were basically being told, no, know your place, be quiet. Now, if I think about 2014, and I think about now, and I think about the MISC Global Forum and the engagement there, for example, that's, that is a, such a change, such and a positive one, mm -hmm. such a change, yeah? Yeah. And how much did this change? I mean, we, we talked about, and of course, it's called Globalized Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to talk to both of you a bit about, um, you know, the reality that this a lot of a lot of this is coming from changes inside Saudi Arabia. But this is a Saudi that was already globalized mm -hmm. and definitely was sending its students abroad mm -hmm. for education. You talk about this mismatch between the education, mm -hmm. but you had a whole cadre, mm -hmm. huge yeah. number of Saudis that were coming and studying mm -hmm. abroad. Mm -hmm. Um, and then bringing that experience mm. back there. Um, and I wonder, I mean, that obviously it offered enormous opportunities and skill sets, mm. I mean, for Saudis, but also the, the way of negotiating those shifts has got to be tremendously difficult, right? And we, we know we've seen that. If we think about just the gender relations and things with the expectations of women who go sure. back. Mm. Uh, and then we know some of the tensions between the, what they find when they go back and then you know, what they can actually do. And you know, we had the whole episode, of course, of a lot of Saudi women fleeing mm. the country at mm. one point. And mm. so I'm kind of wondering like, how you can have that conversation go back, right, when you had Saudi women that are out of the country. Mm -hmm. And I know at one time you had sort of media trying to talk about this, about, you know, well, there are reasons why they're changing. Why why is this happening mm -hmm. sort of thing? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering about um, uh, that issue of the Saudis that went abroad, coming back home, and how that was sort of mediated in the yeah. conversations yeah. that you yeah. had. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah. um, you want to say something? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think it's it's imperative to when we speak about youth empowerment. Just going off, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I need to speak on your last question because I think it's very important. There is a concerted effort mm -hmm. on behalf of, of of the government to uh, design, implement effective youth empowerment strategies. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely. I mean, that's a fact. That's beyond doubt across all sectors. Um, what's interesting to to note is that Saudis how they define youth empowerment is important. You know, mm -hmm. youth empowerment is a very fluid term. You can fill it with whatever you want to fill mm -hmm. it with. It could be receiving subsidies. It could be mm -hmm. uh, top-down implementation of policies. Mm -hmm. Saudis don't believe in that model of empowerment. I think I, it's, I have to take this opportunity to mention that, in that in my own research, the top two definitions of what Saudis define youth empowerment as both entail a, de a degree of collaboration between youth mm -hmm. and policymakers. So what, what that means is that mm -hmm. youth want to empower themselves mm -hmm. and don't want to be passive no. agents of empowerment, and mm. I think that's a crucial distinction mm. for for policy implementation going mm. forward. Um, 
there is a discrepancy between how younger Saudis define youth empowerment and how older ones define youth empowerment. Mm -hmm. And there, mm -hmm. you see an important area where policy uh, needs to be aware of that discrepancy. Mm -hmm. Because if older, much, much older, uh, policymakers, uh, again, define youth empowerment through their own lens, yeah. um, it's not in close coincidence with mm -hmm. how youth define uh, mm -hmm. youth empowerment. And we see, I think, a very commendable shift now mm -hmm. by the government to employ and structurally integrate mm -hmm. a lot of young officials mm -hmm. yes. into positions of authority, yes. be it ambassadors mm -hmm. or governors. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is absolutely incredible because mm -hmm. it enables Saudi youth mm -hmm. to not only have the faith in their abilities, mm -hmm. but to see themselves mm -hmm in the upper echelons yeah. of the private sector yeah. and the public sector. Yeah. I think also in terms of vehicles, MISC, mm. um, even 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 more entrepreneurial vehicles mm. of empowerment, these yeah. have seen an uptick in activity. Yeah. I think that reflects one thing, is that it reflects that Saudi youth want to empower themselves mm -hmm. and they don't want to simply receive empowerment. On your question in regards to education, I think these individuals go to universities around the world, come back with mm. their education, and want to serve. Mm. But there, I think it's a matter of, of balancing expectations. Yes. I think also it's a, it's, it's a, it's a matter of employing yourself within yeah. the most effective framework possible. Yeah. Yes. And, and you want to call it labor market friction or wh whatever it is. It's, what it is, is is them having to employ themselves in the right place in yeah. the right time. Yeah. And I think the willness has to be there. Mm. You know, the will from youth to integrate into the workforce, mm. into the private sector, into jobs like consulting, and actually challenge themselves, mm. right? Mm. And I think that's changing rapidly. I think some of them, you know, as, I mean, I think it can be difficult because you do get people coming back and they've got sort of, you know, they've got used to ideas about best practices and mm -hmm. accountability, yeah. transparency, and things like that. And then they sometimes find that, you know, wherever it is they're working, that that isn't actually quite what's happening in reality. So I think this is, you know, I think this is sometimes the danger of when expectations are raised very high yeah. and when these sort of very high, these high expectations sort of collide with sort of the realities of everyday life. That's not just Saudi Arabia, that's everywhere in the world. Yeah. Yes, you know. Um, so it's how do you, you know, how do you sort of make sure that you you maintain that enthusiasm, that you maintain that optimism, you know, um, and you don't sort of sort of push young people into becoming cynical, for example. Um, and I think that's that's a very fine line, and that that you know what that that's always sometimes a difficult. But I mean, I know as Sultan was saying, I mean, you know, you've got very young vice ministers and people like this in very important ministries who. You are absolutely fantastic. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know who. So I, I, this, this inter, you know, this intermediate stratum that that didn't exist before, it absolutely, sure. definitely exists now. I think you've got okay, this gen, just generation, just huh? quickly, this generational, not problem, but you've got a generational reality, if you okay. like, where you have sort of my generation, if you want, <laughs> the sort of the spoilt generation <laughs> who had all the money and all the oil and all the subsidies and everything like that, who are often still in place, you know, and then you've got these sort of younger generations who are sort of coming up, but actually it's a question of sort of, you know, time. You're actually going to mm -hmm. have to wait, actually, for some of these people to, you know, sort of move on, as it were, retire and what have you. And a lot of, you know, a lot of people sort of talk about that. They talk about that this is just a reality yeah. that you just have to deal with. But, but you know, this is, this is most definitely happening. Yeah. When you were talking about, just one last question, let's move on. When you were talking about issues of transparency and accountability, mm -hmm. did the Shura Council come up in your discussions? Because I know when I was in Saudi, I mean, people yeah. were talking at that time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, coming out of the King Abdullah era mm -hmm. and stuff, talking about the Shura Council mm -hmm. as, a, as a vehicle and mm -hmm. maybe having elections and transitioning mm -hmm. it into something that could mm -hmm. could do that. Is it something that was discussed? It came up kind of occasionally. Voice? It didn't come up very often. And when it did come up, it was... Uh, usually dismissed as being, you know, sort of not relevant to our lives, um, mm -hmm. as being just a talking shop where nothing really happens. And I think that raises the question of, you know, is, is the Shura Council actually explaining what it's doing properly to, to Saudi society? Is it, is it relevant in what it's doing? Because certainly a lot of these young people, they didn't feel sort of that, 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 that uh, that entities such as the Shura Council were really sort of speaking to them. Mm. And that was, I found <coughs> that interesting because that reflected um, the research that I did for, as you, you talked about earlier on for my first book about sort of the national dialogue, that very much mm -hmm. reflected 
sort of societal attitudes to that whole national dialogue process, which at the beginning, when expectations were raised so high that this was going to happen, to at the end when it was, everybody was very cynical about it, when everybody felt that, you know, these people just meet and talk and they make recommendations and then the recommendations just disappear into mm-hmm. some desk somewhere in some ministry. So, you know, that, that we've seen that happen before. And so obviously I think people are worried that, you know, that type of thing ha- will happen sure. again. But I, 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 I think such, you know, sort of we, what we've also seen over the years is that these institutions are very often um, very bad at actually informing society about what it is that they're actually doing. Yes, um, and that, and and then you get you know this sort of silo mentality as well, where institutions are sort of acting within bubbles, where they're not sort of engaging horizontally, where their du- work is being duplicated and things like that. So I think that you know sometimes you ask when we would I would ask people like what do you, you know in the focus groups you know well, how do you feel about the Majlis Ashura and things like that, and they would just sort of say well we don't really know what it does. Mm-hmm. Um, that's you know so where's the problem there you know? is it is it coming from the, the messages are not being conveyed correctly you know are they not selling it properly i don't know but i mean it was well, you did have a lot of demands in the kingdom yeah. as well coming yeah. from below you had petitions oh. and oh, things yes, at yes. one point for oh, having yes, elections yes. and these sorts yeah. of things yeah. so um but and, and i guess there's different viewpoints mm. about how the mm. shura council mm. oh, no, uh, yeah. can be used i think i mean the only thing is i mean you know people said if we you know yotla these young men or you know when we were talking about it said you know I don't expect to be a member of something uh-huh. like the Majlis Ashura, but I do feel that I should, or somebody of my generation should be there in an advisory role or mm-hmm. something. Mm. Well, let's, um, we have some questions now mm. coming in. Uh, so uh, let me go ahead and go for, we actually have a question in the room. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Ambassador I'm Dick Sullivan, Sullivan uh, from AGSIW. Um, this is a question for both Mark and Sultan. Um, when I was in Saudi Arabia a few weeks ago, as I mentioned, after a five year gap, I sense the energy and enthusiasm yeah. that you've both talked about, yeah. but there was also an undercurrent of discomfort, if not opposition to the scope or the pace of reform, especially social reform, mm. and uh, gender mixing, and the change in attitudes toward, and the certainty of you know, economic life in the future. So mm. did you sense, either of you, in your, or where is this kind of, um, concern, uh, reluctance coming from? Did you sense it in your research, or is this from outside of the young generation? Well, no, I mean, I sensed, I mean, I sensed this quite a lot, depending on who I was talking to, where I was talking to them. I think some of this is linked to, the you know, change can be difficult, change can be something that is quite frightening, um, and when change happens very quickly, uh, I think it can be threatening for some people, and again, that's not just Saudi Arabia, that's anywhere. Yes. And I think sometimes when when that happens, then what a lot of people do is that they then revert back to sort of known knowns, if you like, even more. Um, I think there are some aspects that make some people uncomfortable because they feel that it contradicts sort of their social norms or Islamic teachings and things like this. And I think for some it's about, you know, sort of um, how do we, you know, sort of how do, how do we sort of deal with this? I think for me personally, and, and, and I, I think one, a problem is if you basically look at certain sections of society and you sort of basically say to them, right, you know, this is the way things are now, get with the program. You know, and if you don't get with the program, then you're sort of going to be left behind. I think that's dangerous. And um, actually, we discussed this at a, a workshop in Riyadh not that long ago. Um, you know, I, I think that's dangerous because y- you can't sort of talk about inclusivity if you then at simultaneously so are basically saying, well, sorry, but you're not sort of keeping up. So we're going to sort of marginalize you and push you out. I mean, in any society, you're going to have, you know, you have these differences. I mean, we've seen this with you know, in my country with Brexit and things like this. So I think, you know, it, it's, it's very important that, that, you know, being inclusive also t- is there's awareness that some of these things might cause confusion, that might cause apprehension, anxiety amongst people. I mean, and of course, when it's linked to sort of economic issues, yes, of course. Mm. I, I would um, respectfully disagree, I think, especially as a member of, the, mm. of that cohort, you know, that segment of the population, Saudi youth, you just have to look at the demand. Saudi youth have been engaging mm. in um, leisure or fun activities or concerts mm. or whatever 
abroad for years. And instead of, you know, squandering that money abroad, why not have it contribute to national development? Why not increase mm. local tourism, you know? Mm. Why not have these things? Mm. Um, as Mark said, you're always going to have a diversity of opinion. So the question of itself has a sort of logical fallacy because you assume that it's either everyone's on board or everyone's not on board, mm. or that the tiny minority that may not be, be on board mm. is a louder voice, mm. you know? And um, I think the will and the desire to open up and have a more open, gender-balanced society has always been there, but now there's the opportunity. And, and speaking to your, your piece on the ambition, I think um, His Royal Highness Mohammed, uh, Mohammed Salman has been very successful in instilling an invigorated sense of ambition and dynamism mm. in the youth. Mm. And part of that is um, relating to youth. Mm. So there's that relatability piece, right? And um, in the process, they're both ambitious and they both, you know, uh, they, they, they also want to reflect their, their desire to enjoy and have fun. And, 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 and you don't have to look beyond the numbers of demand mm. to see how popular this push is. And I don't, I don't think you'd ask any individual in Diyal did there otherwise, is the pace of reform too fast? And he would say, oh, it's, it's way too fast for me. I think, in fact, he'd, 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 he'd want a bigger push as well. That's the ambition. But I think but there I is think some. I think there is a certain amount of people who feel, un, you know, feel uncomfortable about some of the things that have been imported, if you like, which they do feel contradict, you know, identity, if you want to call it that. I mean, I know, for example, one of my students said to me, you know, why should we import the worst of the worst when we can actually ourselves, sure. as young sure. Saudis, sure. create these things ourselves? So, I mean, I've done a lot of surveys amongst, you know, young people about some of these entertainment, for example, the wrestling, um, you know, the Korean boy band and stuff like this. And it is quite surprising, Absolutely. actually. You know, actually, there is a lot of opposition to those types of things. Not, it's not opposition to entertainment. You know, as one, as one, one young man said to me, he said, it's not, about, it's not about entertainment. It's about entertainment being appropriate, exactly. you know? Exactly. And I think that's very important. I think there's been, you know, from the General Entertainment Authority and what have you, I think there's obviously been a certain amount of trial and error, mm -hmm. you know, what works, what mm -hmm. doesn't work, you know, what's economically successful, what isn't and what have you. Um, and I think, you know, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing the lessons being learned, for example. So, you know, when they had the first concert in Bureda, they obviously had Mohammed Abdu, which makes perfect sense, you know. And so some of maybe some of the more bizarre things that we'd seen <laughs> uh, <laughs> earlier on, like Mariah Carey, you know, you know, there's one when I, you know, when she came to Jeddah. Nicki Minaj. Yes, yeah, Nicki, well, Nicki Minaj, yes. But Mar Mariah Carey, you know, and my students were all like, who? You know, and I was like, Mariah Carey. And they were like, who? Oh, generationally, that yeah, was a generational thing. thing. <laughs> exactly. They were like, you know, we Maybe weren't Nicki even Minaj born, you know. So and Yanni, you know, who seems, to reside per <laughs> who seems to reside permanently in the kingdom these days, you know. Yeah. And my students were saying to me, oh, are you going to see Yanni, yeah. Dr. Mark? And I was like, uh, no, I'm not. And they, and they said, why not? I said, Google him. And they did. And they went, oh, he's older than you. I said, precisely. <laughs> there is a certain degree of nimbleness, I think, in, in, yeah. in terms of institutions mm. that General mm. Entertainment Authority has implemented mm. the public decency law. Mm. I think yes. right after, right after mm. a bit of you know friction happened, they mm. immediately, and that's I think a very mm. successful yeah. aspect of policy. I mean, mm. their, their their response to mm. the general sentiment I think has been incredibly successful on behalf of the GEA, mm. and I think that's something to be to be mentioned. One question um, that just came in that's very apt then about appropriate entertainment and, and where the entertainment comes from uh, was from Jose Palayo. Thank you, Jose, for the question. Uh, <laughs> So the question is about uh, basically the, this whole issue of the productivity of art, if I can say that, um, and particularly the role of Saudi art and culture. Mm -hmm. So um, it was that kind of thing you talked about importing art, but also there's a certain production, right, mm -hmm. of that. So how is this uh, transformation uh, in the art sector um, helped in kind of uh, both internally in this expression of sort of national identity and then also uh, in terms of soft power? I can give an example. Um, I had two students who were both engineers, um, but who both liked drawing. And they used to swap their drawings on, on WhatsApp with each other. And a year later, it was 300 of them not just within the university, but within the Eastern province. So three, and they, and they actually formed 
uh, a group which they called My Art, no, We Art, sorry. We, you can look at the, for them online. And they actually managed to, you know, get a, uh, a sanctioned uh, art show at uh, Rashid Mall and, and where there was music playing and everything like this. Um, I think this shows, you know, how, how, how young people see, you realize that they can use art, that they can use culture. Um, as a sort of version of soft power and, and uh, as sort of promoting sort of Saudi soft power. I mean, there's no doubt that, that artistically, culturally, there's been this explosion across Saudi Arabia of all of this, uh, whether it's documentary filmmaking, whether it's photography, um, whether I went to the Demand Theatre Festival not that long ago, which was really all Saudi groups, theatre groups from um, all different regions of Saudi Arabia. And um, all the performers were male. But when they called the director up onto stage, the director was female, <laughs> which I thought was fascinating. And when they called the set designer up onto stage, the set designer was female. And this was a, a, a group from Jizan mm -hmm. as well. So it was absolutely, you know. So I, I think we definitely see that. Um, oh, so what was the question about the production? I think, yeah, I mean, I think all of this is. is is helping to it brings people together and it brings people you know the arts and culture this brings people together it brings a sense of of not you know of regional identities national identity i think i think it's incredibly important mm -hmm. mm. well let's i have a couple more questions and we're running out of time so let me oh, give right. one for <laughs> sultan and one for mark mm. um is it okay for sultan um is it hard, or maybe you can ask, why is it hard for a Western audience? And I know that was something that was particularly interested in you, how the Western audience is seeing it, to understand kind of how Mohammed bin Salman is working with young people or empowering them. Why is it difficult um, to see that? Um, that definitely is not, I mean, I think we have some of that yeah. narrative here, but uh, for sure, I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, perception or, or belief in this country um, about, you know, more difficult relationship of Mohammed bin Salman with, uh, especially with uh, you know, arrest of women activists and this sort of thing. So I think that definitely has influenced it. Um, so what do you think? How how do you see this kind of, um, uh, I guess, the perception and relationship? I mean, you're here living in the West, mm -hmm. so I know that you definitely deal with this all of the time. Why do you, what? How do you see this dynamic playing out? Okay. Um, so if I, if I get the question correctly, why is the perception? Well, I want to just generally, I mean, the question mm. was sort of like, uh, mm. why, why is the U.S. having difficulty seeing this empowerment that I we're see. discussing? Yeah. I see, I see. Um, okay. And I think you're, you're okay. here in the U.S., you probably hear sure. a lot of this sure. feedback a lot of times. Well, um, I think it's, so like I mentioned for in, in the beginning, it's, it, the, there is a view that Saudi youth are just this monolith. They're mm. either alienated mm. or they're empowered. And there is this no, there's no in-between, there's no gray area. I think the Crown Prince has, has done an incredible, incredible job of relating to this over 70% of the population mm -hmm. and invigorating a sense of optimism and ambition in each mm -hmm. and every one of them. Mm -hmm. The issue here mm -hmm. is that Saudi Arabia has become a partisan issue. Mm -hmm. And in a hyper-polarized mm -hmm. era of mm -hmm. American politics, mm -hmm. youth are, are, I mean, securing votes takes precedence over youth and over how and, and over an objective view of how empowered they are. And quite frankly, Saudi youth are not really concerned and don't lose any sleep no. with regards to whether or not the West views them as empowered or not, because they know no. and they witness and actively participate in the mm. process of empowerment. Mm. And that's what matters. Mm. You know, it doesn't really matter if mm. X politician or Y politician viewed Saudi youth as empowered or alienated. No. Quite frankly, it makes zero difference that's right. in reality. Mm. And that's an important point yeah. to make, is that, quite frankly, Saudi youth are not here to impress anyone. Mm. They embrace their uniqueness, and they show it on... true, I mean, because I think, actually, Saudis are very concerned about their image. I think they're very well, concerned about their image. Well, that's not necessarily the case. And I mean, not just their image, but um, kind of their role in the, the way that they're engaged uh, globally. Well, uh, the I, kind of conversations that are taking place globally. Sure. No, I definitely think I think there is there is a subtle difference here. They they definitely care how their image is presented. Absolutely, but if it's if if they're viewed through the lens of partisan politics, mm. then the legitimacy of the individual. Who are you talking about you're talking about American American politics. politics? The legitimacy of the individual who views them through a partisan lens is then. Yeah. 
you know, brought into question, right? And quite frankly, um, it has become a partisan issue uh, in a very sad way. I mean, if you generally align towards the left, you have a negative view of Saudis. And, I've, and I see the implicit and explicit stereotypes mm. um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. And we work to break those mm. within our, our, our sense of uniqueness, right? Mm. It's not that I'm losing any sleep, but I'd love to show who we are as youth, right? Mm. And then if you align on the right, you generally have a more favorable view. Mm. Youth and the lives of youth and whether or not they're empowered should not be a partisan issue. Mm. And in a, in a hyper-polarized era, securing votes now takes precedence over an objective, mm. real view of how youth are empowered. And I think that's a very, 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 very important point mm. to make. Mm. And um, mm. again, Saudi youth, I, I think, mm. have, have, have great uniqueness to show. If, again, you can take the cloak of partisan, partisanship off and really view them for who they are. So he said the partisan they're responding as well, though, to, like you said, to votes. So these are concerns mm -hmm. that are there in mm -hmm. the American public, at least for some. Mm -hmm. um, Mark, uh, you said, uh, so I have a question for you real quick. Uh, do you think midi media coverage of events in Saudi Arabia, uh, well, it's a very related question, dismiss the role of youth? Uh, is it on purpose or, or by ignorance? Do you think that's happening first off? And, and how do you then, I guess, similar question, pursue the portrayal of Saudi youth here. I, I mean, I, I, I think it's changing to an extent, but I think very often um, it's there's a certain amount of ignorance, yes, but there's also this problem of, um, although it's lessening, there's a problem of, you know, sort of accessibility as well. Um, there's a problem of people, you know, visiting Saudi Arabia, but only going to Riyadh, only sort of talking to sort of one sort of group of Saudis who are the sort of the Saudis that they would probably talk to outside Saudi Arabia as well. So I think that, you know, as Sultan was sort of mentioning, you know, you get this very sort of one dimensional sort of view uh, of, of, of young Saudis. Um, I took a, a group of um, people from London um, to the MISC Global Forum last year um, in November. Um, when the the top the topic of the forum was employment, and they were just amazed, you know, and they actually sort of said, you know, we don't have an event like this in London, you know, and yet you, they have an event like this in Saudi Arabia, and and they, it opened their eyes. Um, so I mean, there is, a, you know, I think sometimes depending on who you talk to, sometimes it's on purpose. I mean, I think sometimes when it goes against, sort of, it doesn't fit with uh, the narrative, if you like. I mean, what I like, you know, certainly where. I, in London, what I call the London narrative, it doesn't sort of fit with that. It doesn't fit with how people want to see this. You know, mm -hmm. people want to, you know, sort of. It does. You know, it, it, I think there are a lot of people who are actually quite happy to be within their echo chamber and sort of, you know, make sure that that they don't actually get challenged by sort of new mm -hmm. ideas about sort of young Saudis and this young population in Saudi Arabia. Um, it varies. Um, it's both of them. It's, it's sometimes it's, it's it's sometimes it's on purpose. Sometimes it's ignorance. Uh, sometimes it's pure lack of knowledge about Saudi Arabia. Full stop. Mm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. So what? Um, I think we're running out of time. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe if you can tell me just what's was the most surprising or interesting thing that you learned in having these conversations on a more Day-to-day we day level. <laughs> have I mean, we got I another know. couple of hours. <laughs> um, I, one, well, yeah, there is an interesting thing. When I, when or I, surprising. Yeah, we're surprising. Yes, when I, when I um, talked to these young men about generational differences, I automatically assumed that they were going to talk about the difference between them and their elders, their 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 parents or their grandparents. And actually, a lot of them actually pointed out the difference between them and their younger siblings. You know, and they were sort of by saying, you know, my younger siblings, my younger brothers and sisters, you know, on a tablet or on a screen 24-7, you know, and they don't sort of go out it and play like we used to play and things like this. And this was interesting. I hadn't sort of thought about that. But then I thought, well, no, that's actually a conversation that's happening globally. Yeah, it's not just in Saudi Arabia. But it was interesting that, you know, these sort of young sort of 20-year-olds had already sort of sort of worked out that this was a problem, which they, which they felt was, was, was detrimental to the future of, of their families. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think um, that's definitely one lesson. I mean, when we look at Saudi Arabia, like you said, and one thing that you talked about Mm. is it's uh, definitely connected Mm. to the rest of the world, especially these days. And a lot of the trends that we Mm. see Mm. happening on globally are happening in Saudi Arabia, too. Some of these things you're talking about, like, well, employment, these sorts of things. These are things that we could talk about in any place. Yes, absolutely. But uh, I want to thank both of you for coming, both of you for traveling and uh, yeah, joining us here at the Institute and, and sharing your views you. um, at this time and uh, really educating all of us a, a bit about the trends in Saudi Arabia. And also want to thank you, Mark, especially for your book. Um, and I recommend everybody get most into welcome. it. There's a lot more interesting details in the conversations. You're most welcome. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you very thank much. You. Thank you for having thank me. You.